Fifth Hour Radio Show. Hey, Michael, this is Robert from the 25th Hour Radio Show, and sitting beside me is Randy. How you doing today, sir? Hello, both of you all. I'm good, thank you. So, Michael, I, I, got, I got to know, how did you get into the design business in the first place? Was it something you always wanted to do from a young age? You know, I, I would say to you that it never literally crossed my mind in a logical way except to say that I had, I was looking at clothing my father had a tailor in New York City. I used to go with him to the tailor. And I could see, in my mind, from my point of view, this was good, this was bad, this was flattering to him, this wasn't flattering to him. The same with my mother. Took me to maybe at eight, nine years old, took me to a fancy lady's store and put on three different dresses and said, I'm going to this big ball for uh, raising money for cancer, you know, which is the best one. My mother was beautiful, redhead, with a great body, and, uh, you know, I told her this is the one. She got over with it. Um, I mean, it was a very unusual dress for that time. Um, so I sort of had a feeling for it, but I didn't really know much about it. And as I was a young man, I was buying clothes in the village at uh, what was then considered to be a very hip store, Village Squire, and I fooled around just a little bit with sewing machines because I didn't always have the money to buy what I wanted, so I would want something. And uh, I brought a, a boat, an ocean racing sailboat to Florida to race in what they call the Southern Circuit, meaning six weeks worth of racing in, you know, end of January into February. And I dislocated my shoulder, and the doctor told me, don't go near a boat for a year. I was living with a girl, and people would see she had a sewing machine from a kid that worked with her, took care of her baby, and, and people would see the clothes that we were wearing in some nightclubs, and this is like 1960, end of, beginning of 66 into 67. People would see the clothes that we were wearing in these nightclubs, and this was at a time when there was no clothes at all other than preppy clothes in the United States, mm. or certainly in our area. And people were freaking out over the clothes. You know, I went to visit my parents up north in the suburbs of New York, and I can remember walking in. My parents had a huge home on a big piece of land, and my mother was in the water in the pool, which she never was. She just wasn't a pool person. And I can remember walking in, and she said, where did you get those pants? I said, I made them. And she said, oh, you should do that for a living, meaning they'd given up on doctor and lawyer. And they were just hoping <laughs> for not the post office. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they were praying for not the post office. And, you know, she was just, you know, I said, you should, you should do this. I didn't even think of it, except to say after... You know, for almost a year, I started to run out of money from having worked on these ocean racing sailboats. Um, and, you know, one thing led to another, and we made clothes. We had made some Nehru kind of shirts for a local band in Tampa, and we sold all five of them to the five members of this little band for $18. And I said to her, well, we're rich. You know, obviously, this is almost $100. We're, we're, we're rich. <laughs> you know, and from there, I told her one night, you know, we started to make clothes for some of the local groups. And then one night, and obviously, you know, even though people don't admit it on your radio show, you know, some of us are morons. So obviously, I'm in the moron category. And I, I said to, to Tony, my partner, I said, listen, I'm going to bring home the vanilla fudge. They're claiming at this armory near our house. I'm going to bring them home to so straighten up the house. You know, <laughs> this is my, my line walking out of the thing. You know, I'm just a moron. And I followed Carmine, who obviously was on your show. Obviously, Timmy was, too. Mm -hmm. I followed Carmine into the bathroom of this local, this, this um, I don't even know what to call it. It's a place where the military would have a, you know, big building to work out of an, an armory, you would yeah. call it. Mm -hmm. um, I followed him into the bathroom, and I said to Carmine, I make clothes, where do you get your clothes? So he says to me, Carnaby Street, meaning England, the village, meaning New York City, and Haight-Ashbury. That's where he'd get his clothes. Mm -hmm. I said, well, this is 
what we were making, and what I was wearing was way better than what he had and what they had. I said, you want to come to our shop after the gig? Come on. Our shop, meaning we're working out of a, you know, $100 a month rental house in South St. Petersburg, Florida, you know, with a bunch of industrial sewing machines in it. <laughs> um, so three of the four guys came, and they bought everything that fit them in the house. And, uh, you know, it was a pile of money for us. And then soon after that, they went on Ed Sullivan's show, which was the thing to see, you know, for music in those days. Obviously, the Beatles were on it, Fudge were on it. You know, and everybody else named, you know, all Motats were on and stuff. And I called my parents you know, who were really king straight kind of people when it came to music and were not into this rock and roll thing at all. And uh, I said to them, you know, we're going to have these clothes on the stand called the Vanilla Fudge. They'll be on Ed Sullivan tonight. You should watch it. So I called the next day. I said, well, what do you think, Mom? And she says, well, we like the clothes, but they were goons. She tells me they were goons. Do this word. I said, Mom, they're from Far Rockaway. It's a rock and roll band. It's show business. They put on a show. Then I boom. They're like everybody else in the neighborhood. You know, this is just commerce. Um, so from there, they played, and, and now we're getting into, I'd like to tell you it was our greatness and talent and all that stuff, but there was a, a bit of um, what you would call uh, luck or fake karma or... You know, whatever he would call stuff. They fudge go a couple of weeks after the, the uh, Ed Sullivan show to play a pop festival in Atlanta, Georgia, and Hendrix is playing it with them. While they're going to that gig, I'm seeing a local guy who's a record producer who produced Abraham Martin and John and Snoopy versus the Red Baron and Stay by Maurice Williams and the Zodiacs, a guy named Phil Gernhardt, mm -hmm. he's bringing in Jimi Hendrix. So I go and see him, and I show him the clothes. I said, we'd like to meet him. And he, he's a guy, and I don't mean this as an insult, but he doesn't have any really clothes sense. He's not born with that gene, let's say. It's like, if you say to me, Michael, we're going to pay $1,000 a day for the rest of your life to either make wedding dresses, which I know nothing about. I don't wear dresses. I don't think about dresses. I don't think about weddings. I, you know, it's just I don't know about it. Will I take your money? Yes. I will make a wedding dress, you know, every day for the rest of my life for $1,000. But they'll probably be whorish, and they won't be really that good because my heart isn't in it, meaning I don't really feel wedding dresses. But um, getting back to where I was, the... the um, I forgot where I was. You're talking about uh, Jimmy, Jimi Hendrix. I guess I guess he come so, by. So, so yes. Yeah, so I I see this this show doing art, and he says, "Call me at four o'clock on this Sunday. We're gonna go pick him up to be in the limousine and stuff. And when we do, I'll mention him." I, he said, "But I'm not gonna push it on him because I'm I'm trying to get a great performance out of him, and I don't want to bother him. You know, these are emotional kind of people. I don't want to bother him before the gig." I mean, he's not making any money out of it. doesn't mean anything to him. And now we're back to the fate karma or the fate of this thing. And, and I call Phil, and he says, before I could open my mouth, Jimmy's asking, where are the clothes people? We have played this gig with Carmine in the Vanilla Fudge at this Atlanta pop festival. Mm -hmm. Carmine showed him the clothes. He obviously saw the clothes and said, Carmine, what's the deal with this? And Carmine says, well, there's some people in Tampa, Florida doing this. Anyway, long story short, I go, and I've done the homework and asked people, a guy named Rodney Jusco, Rodney and the Mystics had that song, Georgia Pine. He had played in England. He, you know, had toured with some people and was around him before he had come to the States, so he sort of knew the deal. And I asked him all about it and all that. And I, I, we were really young, really green. I go with my business partner, Tony, a girl, 
and another guy that's carrying clothes with us. I mean, we didn't even have bags for the clothes. We just had them over our arms. I knock on this door, and I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to either Noel's room, Noel Redding, or Mitch Mitchell, the drummer and the bass player. I figured I'm going to ease my way in that way before I try to talk to Jimmy, and which is definitely not the thing to do, but I didn't know. I was just young and green. And uh, I knock on the door. The door opens up. And at first, we hear Jimmy's voice. He said, who is it? I said, it's Michael and Tony with the stage clothes. The door opens. The chain is on the thing. He looks out. He sees us with our arms full of clothes. He opens the door. He's wearing a pink or reddish flower kind of shirt. He's wearing pink what cotton pants that were originally white. Navy issue, meaning English Navy, with buttons across the front, um, and no shoes. We walk into the room. He has the TV on, a football game. Sound is off. He has a record player there that someone's brought in. It's playing records, and he's got B.B. King on. He's got Eric Clapton on it. And he, they have a roll-in table where, you know, they brought his dinner. So he's sitting, eating the dinner. His, he's almost laying horizontal on the chair, not literally, but like on a 45-degree angle. And I'm laying the pants out on the floor, and I'm not getting over. I could see I'm not getting over, meaning the pants were too street kind of oriented. And he's, he's looking at the pants, he's looking at the food, he's looking at the TV, and... Each time someone would get tackled really hard, he would go, oh, like that, you know, like he would be feeling it. And the record player is going. And so I see I'm dying here, and as we get now up into the more street kind of clothes and clothes that he eventually would wear, we had bought, if you can imagine this, a panel, meaning it was a meter long of fabric that had embroidery in a triangle. Maybe the triangle at the bottom is maybe 12 inches wide and maybe two inches at the top. And maybe it's, maybe it's 30 inches long. So there's this triangle of embroidered flowers. And this is before there's any embroidery in the United States. There's no such country as India. There's no such country as China. No one knows about imported clothes except maybe from France or Italy. There's, all that stuff didn't exist. And I had these pants. And they were seen down the front and back, all of our pants were. And it had this panel on the side. So let's say you had um, a red pair of pants with white panels on the sides and red embroidery. I mean, there's pictures of him in these kinds of pants. Um, he sees the pants. He says, what colors do you have, man? I list the colors. He said, I want that. You know, and then we got into velvet and all different kind of things. Um Anyway, the moral of the story was we just fell into getting into the room with him. He liked what we were doing. He liked the fact that we would be just doing it for him. You know, because there was a time that I once said to him, I said, Jimmy, you know, there's a lot of rock bands that come through our shop, you know, that are just playing the nightclub circuit. I said... You know, they see your clothes being made, hanging on mannequins, hanging on hangers, you know, parts being laid on and all that. Um, what do I do? You know, they want these clothes and they can afford them. You know, clothes weren't that much money in those days. And these guys were making, you know, real paychecks, even though they were living from week to week and going from hotel to hotel, you know, every two weeks. Um, he just said, as long as I get them first. You know, that was his his thing. So it was it was uh it was sort of a really weird lesson or a wild lesson to start at the top and then work sideways from there. Meaning in those days you said you made clothes for Jimmy Hendrix to be, you know, if you were a church go and say, Well I'm making clothes for God now. You know, I'm just <laughs> doing some stuff for his wedding, you know. He's getting married in two weeks, you know, I'm making clothes for his wedding, you know, whatever, any kind of it was just a wild sort of experience because if you're into name dropping, there was no bigger name to drop clothes-wise in those days than that. You know, later on, we made clothes for Macho Man, Randy Savage, you know, and it was just the experience.
experience of going meeting these people, seeing why they wanted your clothes on them, you know, what it meant to their careers and stuff, which is from their point of view really business. You know, I mean Macho Man said to me one day, I'm small. Well, I mean, he's almost a head taller than me. His his one arm is bigger than both of my thighs, his bicep. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, let me ask you about that, Mike. Now, you're talking about you're talking about Macho Man. Watching wrestling, I mean, me and Robert both were avid wrestler watchers growing up, still are. And you look back in the heyday, you know, back in the early '80s, late '80s, early '90s, watching these wrestlers and some of the extravagant outfits they had on. When you look at someone like Macho Man, he he was the best dressed. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. With his hand painted glasses and uh, the, you know, what do you call those You're things? Not, what, what do you call those things that hang in. off a hang off of a coat? What are those? Fringe, fringe, fringe. Yeah, yeah I mean that's those. All of us. That's I mean, all that's of us. Awesome. And, and I mean, you you're talking here, awesome. You. Did, did does thank he come you. up with that, or is that your idea? First of all, the answer is no. Definitely, he, he didn't come up with any of it. And, He's back to where Phil Gernhardt was. This is a man with no clothes sense at all. Zero. Nothing. Meaning, if you didn't tell him, this hat goes with these glasses, with this shirt, with this jacket, with this pair of pants, and these armbands, he would wear wrong stuff on TV. <laughs> and I'd have to tell him, homie, what are you doing to me? Are you making me out of a schmuck? you, you got to do this right. But he knew where he was at on that, and, and he came in the very beginning with Elizabeth, and he calls me up one day, and he says, you know, that the uh, Hulkster told him that he could make some clothes, we could make some clothes for him, this and I said, well, come on. Anyway, he, I, I, he said he wanted these capes. I said, dude, I don't really have a feeling for capes. I'm not a cape <laughs> guy. I'm Kate. not thinking about capes. You know, this is not what I do. You know, you want something from me, I gotta feel it, and you know, I, you know, it'd be like saying to a rock person, "Go play classical music," or a classical violinist, you know, "Go play heavy metal." They're going, "I don't even know what you're talking about, really." You know, not all, not only couldn't I do it, I have no idea what you're really meaning. Anyway, so Randy says, so I say to Randy because he wants me to make him shorts and capes. I said, the "Capes, I made him a few." I said, "This is not, you're not getting what we really do here." And he was a huge Hendrix fan. Um, and so what happened was he said he he walked in the shop one day after we made clothes for him for a while, and I told him I'm not making any shorts. He <laughs> said that he got over in the shorts with the, you know, he had like two-inch letters that says Macho Man across the back of his ass. Well, I mean, and, does he I'm get combative when you tell him no? I mean, when you say, no, I'm not no, doing no, that, no. he's like, oh, yes, no. you are. <laughs> No, no one says anything like that to you. Meaning, there, um, no, it, it just doesn't happen that way. I mean, if there's only two people in the room, and you're not pushing me around. Not that I'm standing up to you. It's just you're coming to me for my art, you know, for your career, you know, and I got a history. So you're trying to get the best out of me, you know, you, but you're not going to do it by force. Right. I mean, that's a, it's just my nature, too. You know, I'm just a soft person. This is strictly business. I'm making clothes. He, you're walking into a shop, you know, with thread on the floor, and it's dusty, and there's all these sewing machines there, and then you're seeing clothes, you know, and beautiful pictures of all kind of clothes that we make and album covers. You know, there's not much you could say except, you know, you're listening to what this person is saying, if it makes sense, you're thinking about what they're saying. So he said, he walks in, I told him I'm not making shorts, I wouldn't waste my time on it. I said, I need real estate. I need from the floor to two pieces, two feet past your head. So what happens was he walks in one day with his head down, and this is an emotional guy and a smart guy. His head is down, and he says, you can make whatever you want. That's all he said. That's the kiss of death to someone that's creative. <laughs> he didn't say you can make whatever you want as long as each outfit isn't over $500. You know, it wasn't that at all. He just said you can make whatever you want. What, ha what had happened was his career had taken a dive in his mind. And so he was willing to let me do what I wanted to do. So I make him five outfits. 
of the five outfits, he had his favorite, but his least favorite, he didn't say to me, well, I'm going to buy it, but I don't really like it, or I don't even want to buy this one. He takes all five outfits, and he tells me after about a month, the first, or maybe a six weeks, the first outfit he wears, he wears his favorite one. Everything goes good. Second week, his second favorite. Third week, now he's up to the last week. It's the fifth week. It's the outfit he doesn't like. It's a purple outfit. It's got chains on it. He doesn't like it. He puts it on. He walks out of the out of his private dressing room into the dressing room where all the boys are sitting, and they freak out. They go, where'd you get that? That's great. So he's thinking, this is the one I don't like. The boys are freaking out, but, you know, what the hell. Now he starts walking down the hall. Vince McMahon sees him. He says, Randy, where did you get this outfit? It's great. <laughs> this is him telling me the story. I said, okay, I see where we're going on this one. Then he says he walked out, starting to walk to the ring, and when they put the lights on, he said it just popped. The audience went crazy. I mean, popped is his word, and he said he really got over it. That that's also his word, or their word, in wrestling. So, what he was saying to me was what he thought was the worst outfit was in fact the best. What he thought was the worst outfit, I was totally right about. He was totally wrong about. And what he was saying was, he said, do whatever you want, meaning he's he's letting you go. And you can't then say, if you say to someone that's creative, you, you make that statement, then they can't say, well, you told me I could do what I wanted, but I could only spend $500 an outfit or $1,000 an outfit or... You you would only let me do what I wanted to do as long as it was purple and red, you know, whatever. There was no limitation to it at all. There's no way I could say, you know, here, well, here's my excuse. You know, you didn't give me enough time. You did. You made it green, and I wanted it to be blue. You know, whatever the story was. Once we started to go, and and in the very beginning with Randy, the wrestlers were wearing nothing except little capes sometimes and shorts. You know, and we started to go with the motorcycle jackets with the fringe to the floor and the glasses and stuff. And then they made him wear, they made him the macho king for a while. He had to wear this yeah. crown. And he said to me, Michael, I want to get rid of this crown. I want it to go to a hat, anything but the crown. What can we do? I said, well, let's go to the hat store. We'll see what they got. I take him downtown Tampa to a store that has every kind of hat from an English bowler to top hats to cowboy hats to Sherlock Holmes kind of hats. I mean, every hat you could imagine they had it there. And we put all the hats on them and looked in the mirror. And really the best was cowboy hats. And so we bought some straw cowboy hats and I painted them with what you would call, uh, there's a paint called One Shot that they use for sign painting, outdoor sign painting. Um, so I started painting the hats and then we did the glasses to go with the hats. You know, when he, and he never told Vince McMahon any of this. He was supposed to be wearing his crown, and he shows up with the hat one day. You know, and the glasses. And he obviously gets over with it, so now the crown is gone. You know, they're up and running. Anyway, one thing sort of just led to another, that the more outrageous the clothes were, the better it was for his career. And in the beginning, I started to say to you, he told me he was small, and I wanted to say to him, who do you think you're talking to? This is Michael over here. Don't tell me you're small. I didn't say a word, but that's what I'm thinking. You know, do you think I'm a moron or whatever? I'm just telling you, your biceps are bigger than both of my thighs together. So I didn't say anything, and then I realized what he was saying because I was in the dressing room with the boys, and I saw that he is actually small compared to most of them, who are yet another head or half a head or three quarters of a head taller than him. I mean, I made close to the to the this guy the big show. His hands were like a baseball mitt from the twenties. You know, it's they were twice as big as my hands. You know, just gargantuan, just you couldn't even believe it. And and I had French double doors leading into our shop. He had to lean down to get in through the doorway. Wow. You know. It was just this guy's just gargantuan, and so you don't always get it from the television exactly what's going on with the proportions of these people. I mean, and the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, was not a huge guy. I mean, he, he was huge 
in his thighs and his arms and all that stuff, but he probably was maybe 5'10". He was this not a huge guy. You know, he had a huge, you know, presence and stuff like that. When you mm-hmm. looked at him and we dressed him up with all the English, you know, flag stuff that we did for him. But, um, but Macho Man, it just, it just, he could carry off what we were doing, meaning there's times when we were making clothes for him when someone would come to the shop and I wanted to see, but just put this, put this jacket on, put this hat on, put these glasses on. I would take pictures of them to see what does it look like just in two dimensions. And nobody ever could bring the clothes to life the way he did. He put it on, you know, and it was a marriage made in heaven. You know, it fit. Meaning you could buy what his face was. You could buy what his body was. You could buy the sound of his voice. You know, you call him on the phone and his phone message was, hey, I'm not around right now. Leave a message and I'll get back to you. And I'm telling you the truth. I'm not, that's, that's his phone message. So, you know, I don't know what else to even say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, talking history there, man, that's, you look at Macho Man and the clothes he wore, it, he brought him to life. They brought him to life. Yes. They yeah. brought him to life. Both they together. took on life of their Both own. Together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. How many How many wrestlers have, have just, you know, I don't want to be nosy or anything, but you brought up a couple of names. How, how many would you say you've worked with over the years? You know, probably 20, 30 guys. Um, you know, and it really happened all all because of Hulk, meaning I had made clothes for Hulk when he was a, a bass player in a local band in Tampa called Ruckus. And you wouldn't know anything or sense anything special except to say, again, this is a guy taller than everybody in the room by a long shot, but he was not a boisterous guy. He was a bass player in this local band. And then, as he told me the story, he went to, and I didn't know this. I didn't know anything about wrestling. I knew wrestling existed. I didn't watch wrestling. I mean, I would see it fanning the channels, but... I didn't watch it in those days. Um, I mean, my wife now says when we first started to go out, the major date of the week was Monday Night Wrestling to see Monday Night Raw, and I was really looking to see the clothes that I had delivered on Friday, what do they actually look like on television on Monday, you know, and know what I have to do for the next month or three weeks of sewing or whatever to, you know, try to top myself or compete with myself or whatever. Um, but Hulk became a big wrestling star in Japan. And then he came here and hooked up with Vince, and the thing started to explode. And he, because we had made clothes for him when he was doing the rock and roll thing, he was going to be on television on Johnny Carson to pump a movie that he was in with, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone, Rocky. And, you know, he said to me, can I make clothes? He said, can you make clothes for me? I'm going on Johnny Carson. I said, well, I made clothes for you before you think I can do it again. I'm still sewing. I still have to sew the you know. What do you think? You know, anyway, so we made clothes for him, and then he, as he became a huge star here in wrestling, unbeknownst to me, he started to send me these people, and they would call me up, you know, and I didn't know who they were. I had to go study the thing, and so I'm telling you the story about Monday Night Raw that, I had to go learn what the hell is actually going on here because I didn't know about it. Um, you know, and the last fight I was in, the last good fight I was in, I was probably six years old. So, you know, if there's a fight, I'm probably running. You know, if there's a fight in the club or something, I'm out of the door. I'm out of there. I'm bringing nothing to the game, you know. Um, so I had to figure out what are these guys doing and what are they actually selling with this fighting thing, this masculinity thing, you know, I'm just, I'm not thinking about it from that point of view of fighting or trying to impress somebody with who I am. I just, I'm an artist, I'm making art, you know, and I was, so I'm making clothes for all these people. I'm not thinking about, um, gee, I think I'm going to, what do I got to do to look like I'm going to, you know, break this guy's head in two or something like that. You know, I just, it's not my... So I had to go figure out what the hell are they actually doing, you know, because we made close to the Ultimate Warrior, too. You know, what is this guy actually doing? What is his image? What are the people, 
expect from him or what is he trying to portray, you know, and then I would go make the clothes, you know, that, that, that's, and not all of work, but some did, you know, and, and, and Randy's a good example of that the clothes fit who he was, and that's why the thing worked. You know, you hear a guy's name, and his name is Sergeant Slaughter, and he wears a military kind of uniform thing, but you didn't have the look in his face. You know, he looked like some sweet kid or something like that. You go, well, he doesn't look like Sergeant Slaughter, but if he looked like Sergeant, Sergeant Slaughter, you know, then the whole thing fits. I mean, Randy, Macho Man, looks like who he is, you know, and obviously his interview and his voice sounds like who he is, and the clothes fit that, you know, so it's it's having all of it work together, really, what's happening. You know, I was reading on your website that many of your outfits are, you know, like immortalized on album covers, you know, posters, magazines, etc. You know, can you give us an idea of some that really stand out in your mind that maybe our listeners can relate to? You know, I'll give you a funny story because it, it, I saw some friends of mine called me up and said, we saw an antique roadshow. I mean, and I'm talking about several people called me on the phone and said, Mike, Mike, we saw an antique roadshow. You've got to watch this thing. It's from Seattle. You know, so I start taping the show, and the first show doesn't have anything to do with it. And they're saying, well, they got these clothes that Jimmy wore at Woodstock. There's your velvet pants there. You know, I'm going, what are you talking about? Anyway, there, this antique road show it was on a couple of days ago, and the show is to have this woman who's an expert on on clothing, you know, like a, an antique, somebody that appraises things and all that stuff. And she's saying that rock and roll clothes aren't worth as much as Hollywood clothes, but this is in a league with Marilyn Monroe's iconic dress where the, you know, the subway the wind is blowing the dress up and she's trying to hold the dress down. That dress sold for $4 million. And she says, and, and this woman is saying these pants are in a league with that because Jimmy wore the pants at Woodstock. Oh, yeah. And what she... What she's saying is the truth, and these are these are aqua-colored, rayon, velvet pants. In those days, there was no such thing as crushed velvet. The word didn't even exist. I never saw the fabric. And I had a steam iron, an industrial steam iron, that had a, a liquid uh, bottle that, under pressure, would pump water into this iron and it would make steam that would burn your hands, but it would make it continuously. If you held the button down, and this is a heavy, thick iron, and what I would do is I'd lay this velvet out on this very heavy, I mean, industrial iron board, and I would just run my hand. I would swirl it back and forth as I would run it up the length of the fabric and then down the other side and make this crushed velvet. And as I was saying, we all these pants that we made had these front and back seams, and we got very known and had many clothes. We had clothes on the cover of Rolling Stone on Alice Cooper and Three Dog Night with these buttons down the side. And they buttoned down the side all the way from the hip. But this was when we first started to do them. They were cloth-covered buttons in those days, and they were just from the knee down. And that's what Jimmy wore at, at uh, Woodstock. You know, I didn't even think anything of it in these days. You know, and then there's zillions of these pictures, you know, on the Internet. And, you know, I mean, Jimmy wrote us a letter um, telling us what he wanted in the way of clothes. And he says, uh, in those days, we were making shirts and I would use Velcro, like an inch square of Velcro, to close the shirt so you wouldn't see anything on the front. And he writes in the letter, he writes... Um, try to make to match the color of the sticky type buttons to the color of the shirt. I Meaning he didn't even know what the word Velcro was. It had just <laughs> come out, and he called it sticky type buttons. Um, and they only made it in those days in black and white. You know, so he's telling me what to do, and then he's saying his, what his favorite colors are. And he says, he says, make anything. Um, I went, I'm going to try to think of the words. Um, make anything that suits your fancy, this kind of thing, you know, make, make it, making it especially as art. Um, anyway, he's talking.
speaking in the letter, he's saying what Randy Savage said years later, meaning go and knock yourself out, you know, meaning make the best you can make for me. And he was like, in his words, he was telling me to just go for it, to just go knock myself out and make stuff, especially as art, um, meaning anything that suited my fancy, try anything, do anything, um, I have to send you a copy of this letter so you'll see what he's saying exactly. It's hard to make it out because it's, you know, it's all handwritten yeah. and stuff, but um, you, you would get the idea. But it's the same thing Randy was saying, meaning they, it's, you're seeing someone that's creative that makes something, and you're saying, homie, you know, go for it. Money is not the object. Just knock yourself out. I mean, so he was saying that thing to me that Randy said, you know, all those years later. So you got a book coming out, right? Called Threads of Rock and Roll, talking about yeah, you know, my, all... you know my my wife because we I'm doing art on a computer and we do these outdoor art shows. I've been doing art on a computer since 1997, and um, we do these outdoor art shows, particularly in the state of Florida. And she wrote a bio, and on the bio there's a picture of me, and then there's a picture of some of the art. And then there's a whole name dropping thing made close with the temptation, Fly in the Family Stone, Chicago, Bon Jovi, you know, it's just on and on and on. Well, people freak out of it over it and they'll think, you know, somebody's a Jimi Hendrix fan or they're a Sly fan or whatever and they want to say, Well, what was Sly like? What was Jimmy like? What was, you know, so and so like? So I'll tell the story or whatever and these people just freak out over it. Well, so my wife saw this happen, you know, and had to listen to this, all the stories a hundred times over, um, and then say sometimes, you know, I never heard that story mm-hmm. before. And she said, and you know, people said to her, said to me, you know, you should write a book. Well, so she heard it. And she said, yeah, we should write down all these stories. Um, to me, there's two things that are happening. One is I don't much live in the past. If, if, if the two of you get on the phone with me and say, you know, well, how did you meet Jimmy? I'll tell you the story. But on my own, I'm not thinking about it. Um, and if someone's not asking me about it, it's just, it doesn't cross my mind that much. Yes, I saw Antiques Roadshow, and I remember the pants that I made, these aqua, you know, velvet pants. But I'm not living in that place. I'm living today. So the fact that the stories are interesting to people, and there's a, you know, as it says on the website, you know, it just came out that this was really, she came up with the title of Threads of Rock and Roll, and she's maybe half done with those, maybe even further, I don't really know. Um, but it's recording all these stories, and, you know, some of these people, I forget who we made clothes for, and then I'll think back on this. I said, oh, yeah, this is what happened with so-and-so on such-and-such a date. I'll remember all this. And then, you know, she'll write it down or it'll be an interview somewhere. and You know, we'll write more and more down. But uh, the lesson, from my point of view, being here's a video that's played over and over again in your life. You say, okay, I see the universe is playing this video, meaning this this, this story is repeating over and over. What am I supposed to be learning from this? Why is this story being played over and over again for me? And and one of the, the lessons, in my opinion, is this, is that if we watch MTV Cribs, meaning here's a show where they walk up to some mansion with a handheld camera, they knock on the door, some rock star opens the door, and you see he's got 20 motorcycles and 20 cars and four girlfriends, and he's got this big, you know, this huge mansion, they, you know, here's the media room and here's the workout room. Here's the bedroom, here's the swimming pool, here's the private yacht, whatever. What they're saying to you with that show is, if you have money and fame and the 20 motorcycles, cars, and the girls, you're happy. And what I'm saying back to you is that I saw this up close and personal. I saw all these people with all of this, and this does not bring happiness. You already know this. The two of you know this. Um... Not that it may not have its moments and it may not have its pluses, but Jimmy said to my business partner, this little Italian girl named Tony, in 1969, 
he tells her this story. He said, women are having sex with me just to say they had sex with Jimi Hendrix. Now, she repeats the story to me. Now, I'm mid-twenties and a moron, and she tells me the story, and I'm thinking, well, you know, if there's a problem, you know, me and the boys, we can help fill in the blanks here. We, we can do something for you here. We can, we can help this thing out. And then I got to thinking about it in a serious way after that. And no one in, the, in those days used the word objectifying women, but people objectified them you know, as as they do to this day, but it was before this was talked about. And Jimmy was being objectified for who he was, his fame. Women wanted to say they had sex with Jimi Hendrix. They didn't care about him. They just wanted that in their, you know, list of great things that they had done to flower themselves up. Um, and so I learned about this from seeing that everyone that went around Jimmy wanted something from him. It was never a direct thing where the three of us, you know, the two of you guys and myself can have a conversation. We could talk about the weather. We could talk about Randy. We could talk about Jimmy. Or we could talk about what's the best burger, where you live. You know, it wouldn't matter what the thing is. Where Jimmy, everyone wanted something from him, so there was a never a one-on-one -on -one relationship at all with anybody. And... This is a very lonely existence to be in when no one can be real with you, let alone who you're, you know, when maybe one woman you're spending time with. But no, everybody wants something from you, and the higher you are up in fame, the more difficult that is for someone to be natural with you, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's, it was a lesson I had to see over and over and over again that fame and money don't bring happiness, you know. It's easy to say, well, I believe this, but I saw it so many times, you know, or we've all been down the road in our lives to say, or if I just had that such and such or that house or that new rug or new, whatever the thing is, you know, I'd be happy. You know, yet five days afterwards, you're looking around and say, okay, what's next? I need another rug or I need another house or I need another car. Or if I just had those wheels, that would just make my day. It might make you day, but I mean, it's, you saw it's 24 hours it was good for. You know, after that, what's next? Well, you're, you walk away. And uh, so, I, so I just saw this so many times over that this didn't bring happiness and, you know, really brought, brought a lot of, uh, whatever, isolation and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And eventually his demise. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, he, he knew this was coming. And I can't tell you how he knew it was coming, but right towards the end, he said three different times, he said, at one point he said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing what I'm doing. And I never heard him say anything like that. And I'm thinking, what the hell is he talking about? And then he said another time, he said, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be needing clothes. I'm going, what the hell is Jimmy talking about? You know, meaning I'm young and I'm stupid. And I'm um, just taking things and throwing them under the carpet. This didn't happen. It didn't exist. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's my point of view. And they came to me one morning, and they said, Jimmy's dead. I said, what are you talking about? He was just here, like this makes any difference. He was just here. He was just here in Florida. He was, maybe, for four or five days. And I'm going, what are you talking about? He was just here. I said, no, no, he's in England, and he's dead, because... His office had even called to say when was he coming back to New York, that they needed him to finish some tracks that he was working on and that he was going to England and all that stuff. They were they called looking for him. Um, you know, we put him on the phone and he said whatever he had to say. Um, but he had delayed his leaving of Florida, so they were just trying to track him down. Mm -hmm. But this was, he had a feeling that this was coming to an end. More than that, I can't tell you, but I mean, he said it three different times, and it, he had never said that before to us, or anything that even um, resembled that. He said, you know, unusual things to us at times. I mean, there's one time I walked into his room, and he said, he said, Mike, you should be reading this book. This is great. I said, what, it's, what is it called? He said, and I, don't, I had no idea what the name of the book was, but it was some kind of fairy tale book, and I'm going, what? 
<laughs> You're telling me I'm supposed to be reading a fairy tale book? What the hell is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> just had no idea what he was even, not even, I didn't even remotely get what he was saying. Or another time, I came back from buying fabric in the afternoon, maybe it's 5, 30, 6 o'clock, I walk in the house, and Tony's there on the phone. She said, it's Jimmy calling from England. I've been on the phone for 20 minutes with him. This is what she says. And I'm going... I didn't even know you could call England. I had no <laughs> idea you could even do this, you know. We're kids, you know what I mean? And and there's no internet, there's no none of that stuff. This is Jimmy calling from England. And and so I get on the phone with him and and I start telling him about these clothes that we were making that we had bought Spanish shawls, silk shawls, with hand embroidered flowers on them and silk fringe. This is a very standard thing, Spanish shawls that you would put like over a piano and stuff. Um, and we were making them into shirts and pants. And I'm describing this to them that the, that the corner of the shawl is the corner of the bottom of the shirt in the front, like by a belly button. And there's this long fringe. And this is obviously pretty savage, but this is where savage stuff came from. That there was all this fringe on and this and that. And I'm describing it. And he says to me, is it too far out? <laughs> and I'm going, what? I'm thinking, I didn't say anything, but I'm going, this is Jimi Hendrix. He's asking Michael Braun, is this too far out? I said, homie, you wrote the book on far out. You're in the dictionary on far <laughs> yeah. out. What the hell are you talking about? Is this too far out? You know, I didn't say it that way, but I said, no, no, this is fine, Jimmy. Um, and, and I said, another time, I said that he had called, they had called and wanted us to come to deliver clothes and, and, and were the clothes finished and stuff. I said, no, they'll be done in about a day and a half. They said, well, Jimmy wants you to bring them, you know, to New York. As soon as you get them done, fly to New York, we'll pay for it and all that stuff. And I said, that's what I'm thinking. It's an album cover. So I said, well, what's the rush? What's the big thing? They said, this is for Life magazine. I said, okay. The shoot for Life magazine. I said, okay. So And we finished the clothes and... And, and brought them there and stuff. And, and and so it's back to that same sort of deal of, you know, how did this thing get set up? How did this thing happen? And, you know, it's just, you know, I said to him, you know, Tony wished she could come. You know, I'm talking to him. He's in his office one day, and it, it, meaning his manager's office, Mike Jeffries. And I said, and I'm talking to him on the phone and I'm saying I'm bringing the clothes, this and that. I said, Tony... Tony wishes she could come, but she can't. And he says, uh, tell her I'll meet her in the next world and don't be late. Hmm. Hello? Yeah. Are you there? Oh, yeah. And he, he said, um, I thought I lost you. Anyway, so he, he, you know, he's saying this thing to me and I'm dying. I'm going, I'm going to tell Tony this? You know, what are you talking about? So it's just, it was the experience of being around these people and seeing what this was weren't fun times of it, there were, but this is also work, meaning you're only getting paid for your creativity. You know, people think this is some glamorous thing. This is what I would say is this is hard work, you know, and you're being made, paid to make a product that someone's career is really riding on. You know, you're thinking this is some, you know, romantic thing. This is not. This is business, and this is down to you know, let's say talking to somebody that's going to school to learn how to design clothes or make clothes or whatever, you think this is some romantic thing. I'd say this is stone business. This mm-hmm. is work, hard work, and, you know. So, so what's In the... those days, you weren't, it, the clothes weren't good, you weren't easy. And that was the end of the story. No ticky, no laundry. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the future like for you, man? Are, are you working on any big projects at the moment? You know, we are in a continuous thing of, as I was saying, doing these outdoor art shows. So we meet all different kind of people in all different kind of, you know, financial positions. And we're making small pieces of art for some people and huge pieces, you know, and filling homes up with art. Um, and the art, you know, when people say, this is, how did you go from making clothes to doing art on a computer? And I, then I say back, this is exactly the same thing. It's actually freer where if I'm making clothes for someone and they say, well, I got WrestleMania coming up or I got an album cover coming up or I'm playing Madison Square Garden, 
their career is riding on it. Money is not the object, but the clothes better be good, and they better fit that person that day, as opposed to if I'm just making art on a computer, which obviously you saw on the website, michaelbrawnart.com, that this is, I'm making the art on the computer, some of it's public, and some of it's not. You know, some of it you say, oh, this is great, how long did it take you? I'm going to say three days. You know, maybe it took a day and a half, maybe it took six weeks before, you know, fooling around with it, a couple hours here or there. Might have been two years fooling around with it, where if you saw it, you'd say, no, Mike, it's good. It's a nine and a half. It's almost a ten. What does it mean? I don't know. You know, it's too busy. The lower right corner, it's too green, it's too blue. I don't know. It just needs something. I don't know what it is. You know, so there's a lot of pieces that are nines and nine and a half. So I'm, I'm making art all the time, but it's really exactly the same thing as as using fabric and patterns and sewing machines and I'm painting a human on a stage that has to be able to move in this, or am I making some art on the computer which comes down to ink being printed on canvas or paper, you know, and then being framed on the glass or being sprayed and coated, and, you know, it's canvas or whatever. It's really the same thing. You just make an art. It's just that this is, I'm not limited to it's got to be for Macho Man and it's got to be WrestleMania worthy. Mm -hmm. It's just, I'm just making stuff and some of it's public and some of it you'd say, Mike, you spent three days on that? What were you thinking? <laughs> you know, it's just, it, there's a freedom to it that, that there's no career on it, there's no date on it even. You know, I'm just making art and some of it's public and they love, and some you would you people walk by, I'm sure, and say, "What was that guy thinking? You know, what is that? You know, and some people just love it. So it's just the game that you play. So what about social media, websites, and stuff like that? You just dropped your website, but if you mind doing it again for our listeners, you got any other social media that you tied into as far as showcasing um, your, your work or uh, you know what you're yeah, up to? Yeah, uh, I would say uh, um, my wife Susan has a thing on Facebook, and she, you know posts our stuff on there, meaning, you know, that she'll go on and say that we've got an art show coming up in Coconut Grove in Miami in February and put the dates and tell what booth it is. And, you know, she'll put up pieces of ours and say, well, this is, you know, some new piece he did. You know, so, yeah, we do that. Okay. And obviously there's the website, michaelbraunart.com. And that's where everybody can go to to find everything they need to know about Michael Braun. Well, they can find some of it. You know, if there's more, key, if there's some piece there that they like and they want to see other pieces that I'm doing like that, they're welcome to email me and I'll send them back pieces that are in that vein. You know, somebody wants, you know, things in a particularly horizontal sort of look, you know, long, thin look, or they want vertical pieces, or they're looking for pieces for offices, or they're looking for pieces for homes, or something over a bed, a long, thin piece, or... Sometimes people buy these small pieces from us, you know, and they'll put a group of them, eight or ten of them together, you know, in a row, vertically or horizontally or, you know, on the side, some big pieces of ours. We just, we met a guy that's uh, an accountant, and he has on his offices maybe, I don't know, eight or ten guitars all signed by all different kind of rock and roll people and gold records on the wall and all the stuff, just like an old memorabilia. And he has tiny pieces of ours that are 14 inches wide by 6 inches high. That's with a 2-inch frame, so the piece is like 10 by 2 and a quarter. Um, and he's got these stuff in between all this, the guitars and the gold, uh, you know, the, the gold records and stuff, that you can hardly see any any paint on his walls. It's just, you know, solid art and guitars and memorabilia or whatever. We just fell into this guy by mistake. You know, he saw us in a show and then he just, he couldn't buy the art fast enough. He just filled in all the blanks on his wall. So then he bought some for his home. It's, it's funny. It's a funny experience sort of to meet all these different kind of people from all different kind of walks of life that buy the art. It's a fun thing to do. Well, Mike, man, I really appreciate you stopping in and talking with us today, man. I love hearing your stories, man. You have a fascinating career. Thank you, sir.
And yeah. I appreciate your time and energy, and I'm glad you did the research and saw what the deal was. And thank you for your time. Water dance is awesome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very Love, much. I can't take my eyes off of it. I, the more I look at it, the, the it's different every time I look at it. It's true, and I have I have a woman that has maybe six pieces of ours in her home, big pieces, meaning the image size is 40 by 32 inches and probably finish it like 42 by 52 or something like that, you know, with a white mat around it and a frame. And um, she loves water dance. She has what you see as a vertical. She has it tilted 90 degrees. She has it as a horizontal, and she always is in her breakfast area, mm. which is right on the water in Florida. And she says that the top speaks to the bottom. It's, it's talking to her. And, and she sits there for the conversation as she's eating her breakfast each day. So it's funny you should say the thing about water dance. But well, it's a favorite it. of ours. It's a love it. I mean, the, the swirls in it are just... I don't know how to describe it. It just takes me to like a different realm, man, just sitting there staring at it. You know what I mean? You know, what you're saying, people say to us in all different kind of words, but they're, they're saying exactly what you're trying to say. It's taking you to a different realm, meaning I'm not painting trees, meaning you already saw 10,000 trees or 50,000 trees in your life, photographs, drawings, green artwork as a background, this and that. Well, I'm not doing stuff that people are used to seeing, so it's very transportive. Exactly what you're saying, people get it's very calming, it's spiritual. I mean, I hear all kind of, you know, words on it, but they're all trying to say exactly what you're saying, you know, in different words. Well, Michael, you are a very talented man, and it's been a pleasure having you on the show today. I'm a lucky man is what I am, and it's great to meet you all. Radio Show.